Hey everyone, my name is Paritosh Mukasi, and um, today we're I'm gonna um, spend some time with you guys talking about um, the optimization functionality that is uh, in Mathematica uh, and how um, how to use the functionality. Uh, what are the different functions? Um, and uh, uh, along with a number of examples on how to formulate problems, how to set up a problem so that you can use the optimization tools, um, et cetera. So I'm gonna go through a number of uh, various examples. Uh, if you have, um, at any point in time, you have any questions, please uh, uh, put them up on uh, in the comments and uh, I'll try to get to, the, uh, get to them as soon as possible. Uh, uh, I'm a kernel developer at Wolfram Research, and right now um, the, my focus is on developing the optimization tools. So I'll be walking you through uh, a, a number of functionalities that we have developed over a period of time. So um, well, if you have been, if you're familiar with Mathematica and if you have uh, ever used Mathematica, you'll know that uh, uh, we, have, we have a number of uh, functions optimization related functions that you can use to solve a, a wide variety of generic problems. Many of them will end with the word optimization. So it's kind of obvious that the, these functions will be used for optimization, but the older ones, you know, the ones, the OG are things like uh, n minimize, uh, find minimum, find argument, find, uh, uh, find maximum, n minimize, minimize, find fit, so on. Um, even though there are um, uh, the, all these different functions, uh, at some level or to a great level, depending upon which function is being used, uh, there is a lot of interdependency that happens behind the scenes between each one of these functions. So we try to leverage our own technology in order to, um, uh, to, to solve the problem in the most efficient way possible. Um, uh, so if we uh, internally, if we detect that a certain problem is of a certain form, and uh, uh, so if we if we detect that to be true, then we'll we'll try to use the most optimal algorithm in order to solve the problem. And that's kind of behind the scenes. This happens within the optimization framework. Um, so so in order to um, uh, get a better understanding, there are the very broadly speaking, when you talk about optimization problem, I'd like to classify them under convex problems and non-convex problems. And the reason that um, I, I, I'm focusing a little bit more on convex is because it turns out that a surprisingly large number of problems, even though they are not um, uh, they're not obvious to look at when when you when the problem is presented, can actually be transformed into a convex problem. And when you saw when you convert a problem into a convex optimization problem, um, you end up uh, having certain advantages. The first advantage is that um, you have highly efficient solvers that can solve the problem uh, for you. And the second thing is, if you get a result and it passes all the checks, then you are fairly certain that the problem that the solution that you have obtained is the global solution. Uh, and that is a really, really important and a really big thing in the field of optimization. Um, so in general, when we talk about convex optimization problems, we'll, we'll be always, or for that matter, any optimization problem, we'll be looking at uh, problems wherein you have an objective function, which we will define as f naught, and it's subject to a bunch of constraints. What makes a problem convex is that these functions, these f naught and fi's, uh, follow this uh, this uh, rule over here, this inequality uh, that uh, that tells us that uh, hey, the problem is convex. Um, and in our framework, uh, though uh, these convex optimization problems can uh, take a number of um, uh, constraints. Uh, so obviously, we can take the equality constraint, but we can also take a number of these uh, these uh, other inequality constraints. So they can be just linear inequality constraints. We call them non-negative cones. Um, uh, it could be a norm cone, you know, like an Euclidean norm. There are semi-definite cones, exponential cones, uh, so on and so forth. Um, the important thing is all these get classified. And if if your constraint and your objective somehow fall under any of these cones or get can be transformed into one of these objectives, you're in good shape. So. So the, the way I tend to look at uh, convex optimization and conic optimization problems is that you start, we have 
the smaller subset is a linear problem, which means that the objective is linear and the constraints are linear. And then if you if you go a little above that, you go to quadratic optimization, wherein the objective is quadratic and the constraints are linear. Second order cone is when the constraints are um, of the norm cone uh, uh, point. Semi-definite optimization is a superset of a second order cone and so on and so forth. So if you encounter a solver or if we have a solver that can solve a general conic optimization problem, it can. It means that we can solve all the other problems because we can transform a linear optimization problem into a semi-definite or a second order uh, or whatever. But we can't go the other way. We can't take a linear, uh, a semi-definite optimization pr uh, problem and expect a linear optimization solver to solve it. So that's why we try to focus on the most generic kind of solvers, and um, uh, you know, they, the performances in in many cases is comparable, but they're also quite robust. Okay, um, so I talked about uh, convex and I gave you a little bit of uh, introduction to convex, but obviously there's a whole lot of things that happen beyond convex. And one of the most obvious ones in, in the field of optimization is mixed integer optimization, wherein uh, you restrict certain variables, certain parameters uh, to be um, uh, integers instead of reals, okay? Uh, I have a question from Sai. Uh, what specialized methods are going to be used? I'll be talking about uh, many of those uh, in a minute, Sai. And uh, again, keeping with the theme of what else can we do beyond convex, uh, we can do con quasi-convex optimization, wherein, uh, wherein your constraints don't actively um, uh, follow the uh, convex uh, inequality, but rather follows this inequality, uh, wherein you, you still have so a convex, uh, sort of a convex region, but it's not it's not a summation of those two. It's uh, it is whatever is the max between those two, and those are classified as quasi-convex. It is. I'm just giving you the definitions over here. What's important is that at the end of the day, behind the scenes, all this analysis happens uh, automatically, and um, uh, at some point in time, it just goes to the right solver. Okay. Uh, again, uh, similar to uh, be a, a quasi-convex, we also have uh, something called as difference of convex. So in case the problem, the, the objective itself uh, or the constraints themselves don't look like they are convex, they can, if they can be separated out uh, into a sum or difference of two, um, uh, two convex uh, inequalities, then, then we can use an iterative method in order to solve uh, uh, solve uh, for that uh, problem using convex optimization solvers. So for example, if you have, um, typically something like this is not a convex problem because, uh, so for example, if you take look at this norm cone, this part, which I just highlighted is technically convex, but this isn't, but you could rewrite this as a difference of convex. So you could use this, uh, the convex solvers in an iterative way and solve for whatever optimization problem in a domain that looks like this. So the, these are these are just uh, some of what uh, just a, just a very brief overview of exactly what what ca uh, can be done. Um, uh, sometimes you may not want to use a convex optimization solver. So in that case, you could use. Um, one of the other uh, general purpose optimization solvers uh, to solve the problem. Uh, and so we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. So just to, again, I'm, I'm focusing a lot on convex optimization because it's, it's really uh, where a large portion of our uh, time was spent developing. Uh, we have a huge number of solvers right now available. Uh, many of them are through a library link uh, that uh, and they are commercial. Some of them are commercial solvers like uh, Gurobi, um, and many of them are um, open source solvers that have been linked in, uh, and and they uh, they are that um, they are distributed as part of our uh, software. So you don't uh, so things like CSDP, uh, SCS, um, CBC, all of these are uh, part and parcel of uh, of the Mathematica package. And so you, you should be able to solve um, a whole variety of problems. 
the mixed integer uh, category, we have a few solvers. Uh, Mosaic is available. Gurobi is commercial. If you have a license for that, you, you should be able to uh, access the Gurobi solvers. Um, uh, CBC is specifically meant for linear optimization problems. Um, and if you if you fall under any other category, we use other methods to uh, solve for mixed integer problems. And I'll, 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 I'll we'll, we'll go into a bit of details for that. So uh, for the linear optimization, we also have support for arbitrary precision and exact uh, computation using simplex or revised simplex methods. For quadratic optimization, we have a large set of um, um, uh, solvers. Uh, and depending upon the heuristics and how how this how a quadratic optimization problem can be um, uh, can be uh, labeled, we can, we can go to uh, uh, various specialized solvers that will solve for quadratic optimization problems. Um, second order cone and semi-definite. Previously, we would solve it using uh, by converting the problem into semi-definite optimization. Uh, but we also have specialized um, methods. They might be a little slow, but like we have. Um, you know, functions that will allow you to transform a problem into a set of linear problems using uh, what is called as a polyhedral approximation, and you can then solve it as a linear optimization problem. Or we have uh, specialized uh, methods called, uh, which we have, uh, which the method is called fischer burmeister which you can use to uh, solve the problems. Um, we also have support for, I, uh, for conic optimization, general purpose optimization problems using IPOct, which is a very, very popular solver um, uh, and it's uh, it's actually remarkably fast for the mixed integer we use outer approximation methods and i'll go into details on that um when we when we get to the appropriate sections so that is for the convex optimization um for the local optimization methods uh, we have um you know the the, the usual gamut of uh, optimization solvers we have basic gradient methods, conjugate gradient, Newton methods, levenberg markarth methods, and so on. Um, with the IP opt, uh, which, has, which was introduced in version 11, you can now use uh, IP opt directly. Uh, internally, it, can, it will also call IP opt even if you don't specify the method. Um, the big thing is that in uh, what happened in version 12 is that we added a whole new framework that actually analyzes the problem you present to the optimization function and if it can transform it into a convex problem or a, or something close to a convex problem, then it will go to a dedicated solver, which means, so what, so what that means is that typically in earlier versions, if you had problems that were taking really long uh, to solve, uh, if the problem were actually convex now the, within the framework, it'll go ahead and uh, solve it as a convex problem. So you'll see, a, you, for many of the problems, you'll see a significant uh, uh, performance improvement. Um, so uh, you could access many of these uh, unconstrained optimization problems uh, or these local methods through fine minimum, for example. So here's, an, here's a simple example. Um, and it'll solve it using uh, automatic IP opt interior point method or convex method. Um, and when we solve this, you'll see that um, you get the results. But when you solve it using convex optimization, it comes back saying it is not a convex method. So, but I did give fine minimum method goes to convex and it still was able to solve it. So how, how did that happen? So if you look at the plot actually of the constraint, this, this constraint over here, it's actually a co concave problem. It's not a convex problem. So this automatic method, when you give it automatic, what it's actually doing is analyzing the problem and figures out that this can be represented as a difference of convex problem and solves it. So that's exactly what's happening behind the scenes. So that there you go. I, I don't know whether you can see it, but let, let me see if I can. You can see that. So it's using the difference of convex method. Um, I have a couple of questions here. Let me quickly see them. Where do models that are strictly cosine based fit? In regard to convex optimization, uh, those would have to go. Those will go through the general purpose solvers. Um, if it can't, if we can't uh, prove that they are convex through uh, our algorithms, it'll go to a regular method to solve the problem. What are uh, Sai? You have asked the question. What are the algorithms used in convex optimization solvers? 
Uh, well, we talked about uh, the different solvers that we use. Um, uh, Newton Raphson, gradient descent, these are general purpose uh, solvers. They don't take into account the uh, structure of the uh, underlying solver. So, um, so for example, um, if I go back, if you so the so these are the solvers that we would use. Um, SES, for example, is a split conic solver. So this is uh, these are very famous solvers. There are papers out there you can read. What it does is it it basically splits the uh, number of co uh, the constraints out and iteratively uh, uh, solves it using a projection method and then uh, uh, obtains the solution. So uh, the, I don't know how much detail you want me to go into in terms of, I mean, there are theses written just on uh, topics of how the CSDP solver or how the DSDP and or CSCS solvers, um, what underlying uh, methods they use. I mean, they're, they're, they're very specialized solvers for this. So um, we, you, I, I would highly encourage you to go uh, on their uh, documentation pages in order to, um, uh, to, to figure out the details. Same thing with things like uh, OSQP. So this, that would be outer sequential quadratic programming. So it, it, uh, it, it iteratively uh, makes a subproblem that is quadratic in HS, solves it and updates it, and that's how it does the, it does the problem. So OK. Um, what about global optimization? Now we do have some uh, 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 certain methods. Nelder Mead, it is cheap, but you know it's it's not really a global method, but it's fast. We have simulated annealing differential evolution, which is the most robust, but it can be a little expensive. Uh, random search is more of a DIY, in because you have if you if you don't give it enough number of points, you know it might it might not find the global minimum, but uh, uh, you know, give it enough number of sample size and it, it should be able to find it. Convex, uh, which I've talked about extensively for the past 15 minutes is basically, if you if it finds a solution, it's guaranteed to be global. Okay, so um, we also, what I should mention is that we have a very uh, robust uh, open source solver called Cohen that has now made it into version 13. Um, that should massively expand uh, the ability for us to solve uh, uh, constraint global optimization problems. Uh, this is a this is a very uh, well known solver and is now available uh, within Mathematica. Um, so, for example, here's um, here's an example where it obviously has is not a uh, it's got many multiple minimas and and what have you. And uh, if you were to plot it, it you know you can you can clearly see that there are multiple minimas over here. And with n min value, you can you can solve it. And many of the simulated annealing differential evolution, when they give the true global minimum, but like things like random search, Nelder Mead don't. Um, IP opt also gives you, if, if you call um, uh, uh, IP opt from within random search so that each uh, sample size uses IP opt to find its local minima, you, you, do, you are able to get um, uh, the global minimum. Um, same thing. If you Im increase the number of search points, you 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 will be able to get the global minimum. It's just a question of how expensive it would need to be. Okay, uh, let's move forward. So let's let's jump into examples because I think I've given you enough theory and exactly uh, you know how um, what solvers are there. But let's let's work our way through a series of examples and hopefully that will give you an idea of how exactly you're supposed to use these um, solvers and uh, there is it's not just about the solvers it's also about the ease of how you can formulate a problem so that it's more, very intuitive and uh, you know doesn't uh, require you to do a massive amount of coding and the, that's what the uh, that's what uh, is happening behind the scenes a lot of really uh, high end parsing happens that allows us to transform the problem into a very good way so here's a cantilever beam problem wherein you know you have a beam with the number of segments and there's a weight to it. And the question is, what should be the shape of this beam? So instead of designing it as a continuous thing, we take the cantilever and we uh, break it into these square cylindrical blocks and uh, and figure out what the dimensions of these blocks should be in order to generate the, um, generate the uh, final cantilever shape. Uh, so in this case, uh, for this example, I've decided to use 16 of these blocks in order to figure out what should be the shape of the cantilever. The more, as you increase the number of these blocks, the more it will lead to the uh, true uh, solution. So um, what uh, the objective is for us to minimize the weight. 
of the of the um, of the cantilever beam. So we uh, set up the constraints, uh, which are uh, based on the stress constraints. And notice it's very generic in nature in the way I have written it down. Uh, I haven't specified any of the parameters yet. We'll do that at the very end, but uh, we can keep it as generic as possible over here. So I've uh, specified the stress constraints. And then uh, what we do is iteratively, as we go from one beam to the other, the uh, deflection that happens on the end of one beam is the start of the deflection on the other beam. So we iteratively, we can set up the constraints. And that's what we are doing in this do loop over here. And then you can say that, well, the maximum deflection at the end of the final beam is supposed to be some Y max, which we haven't defined yet. So uh, we'll, we'll hold on to that. And we'll then the dimension constraints, which which basically gives the physical dimensions. And now we specify the parameters. And now we can solve the problem. And in this case, I specifically tell it to use the Nelder Mead method in order to solve the problem, um, mainly because it's the fastest. And I can I can I know that this is this can will have an optimal solution. Um, and so it takes around 10 seconds, but you get a result. And then you can go ahead and plot that result. And you can see that that's the final shape. If I were to increase the size, you'll see that uh, you know it'll more it'll lend itself more towards a specific shape. Okay. So notice that the way I have specified the problems is just basically how I would uh, describe it in in the content in the, in the written uh, way. So it's so so the parsing and the indexing happens very quickly, and we end up uh, being able to solve it very uh, in a very intuitive way. Here's a second example. Uh, this is called, this is comes from a, a, a fitting example. So let's say that we have um, you know um, a time series and there is a signal associated with it. And this is what the signal looks like. And our um, aim is to uh, approximate the signal, this true signal, using a bunch of um, your standard library functions, uh, li library, not the library for Mathematica, but uh, you know a set of predefined basis functions. In this case, we are using what are called as Gabor basis functions, which are just exponential functions uh, or Gaussian functions that have been shifted and uh, translated and um, you know made wide or narrow. And we don't know how many basis functions are needed to approximate this, so we generate an entire dictionary of these basis functions. So if you were, so I'm constructing this and there are around 30,000 basis functions, but 30,000 basis functions are, is uh, essentially overkill for this. What we want to do is use as few as these basis functions as possible in order to get a good approximation of our original function. So if you want to look at what the basis function looks like, it's basically, you know, these little packets of Gaussians uh, that that are, that get translated and scaled and uh, dilated. So these are basically Gabor functions. And the question is, how many of these functions and which one of them do I need in order to approximate this problem? And in order to do that, uh, we we can directly make use of uh, our fit function. And uh, uh, you can just uh, you can specify that I'm interested in the best fit parameters. So I give the data, I say that these are my 30,000 basis functions, T is the independent parameter, and I'm going to do a lasso regularization. So if you look at the documentation and fit and find fit, uh, uh, you'll see that there are these op uh, options called fit regularization, and you specify a lasso regression. And in this case, let me just put it at one, and you'll see that <coughs> out of um, 30,000, it says that, uh, well, I'll need about 47 in order to get a good lasso fit with a, uh, with a regression value of one. And internally, what fit is doing is it's it's reformulating the problem and sending it off to a convex optimization problem as a convex optimization. So if you look at the result, yeah, the result is actually not that bad. This is the error plot associated with it. I, if I were to change this to 0.5, it may take a little bit more time, but the number of elements that you need just moved up from 47 to 51. So really not that much of a change, but the error becomes a little bit better. And because you have this information, the sparse fit and the best fit parameters, you can actually uh, extract which one of those basis functions 
were uh, used in order to construct uh, the, the fit. And then you can just use those specific basis functions in order to solve the problem. And you'll get a least, and you can uh, obtain a least squares fit for using that. Okay. So, uh, one more question: How do you solve a convex optimization, which are higher order polynomial exponential best current approach? So we do have, uh, depending upon the problem, uh, if uh, we are so if it's a if you know it's a convex optimization problem, just use the uh, function convex optimization. And it'll it'll figure out if all the details uh, uh, behind the scenes. Even if it's exponential, it'll convert it to a power cone. Uh, it could classify it if, if there are polynomials or, or polynomials. Uh, it, it could uh, uh, it could classify it as a geometric problem. Uh, so uh, all that happens behind the scenes. Uh, Sai, so I would I would recommend that you just uh, use the most uh, uh, generic function if you know that a problem is convex but aren't sure which one. You, you just use convex optimization and just it'll solve the it'll classify it for you. Okay. Um, so um, I want to show you another example, which is an image processing example, which typically uh, you wouldn't think of it as an optimization problem, but we can formulate it as an optimization problem. So here we have an image. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to corrupt this image. So that 70% of the data is missing. So you can see it's a it's a significant portion. You can't really make out the original image from this. And the, and we're going to formulate the, so the objective is to recover this original from this corrupted data, but we'll do it using the optimization framework. So in this case, what we do is we basically say that pixels next to each other should have sort of the similar value. So, uh, but, and, and so you, uh, so for any given pixel, it looks to the left and it looks to the top, uh, right and top and says that those pixels should be about the same value. And the objective then becomes to minimize all of these uh, surrounding pixel values with those that are already known. And so technically, so this is our minimization. And if you look at it, our objective is literally a one-liner, which you can write it almost identical to the way I've written it over here. So you set up the objective. You know that uh, uh, there are certain um, uh, uncorrupted values. We know that because we, we have the data available. And so we know what those are and those become our constraints. So at, at those index or those pixel locations, we know what the data is. So that's our constraint. And now we solve it as a convex optimization problem and we recover um, the entire image. It takes a few seconds to solve it. Um, it's uh, The dimension is around 75 by 75. So it takes a little bit of time to find all the all the results, but we get the result, and here is the final solution. So seventy percent data was uh, corrupted. We formulated it as this uh, nearest neighbor pixel uh, problem, uh, for a lack of a better term, and it gives us a pretty decent approximation of the uncorrupted data. So that's a, obviously these are these are just examples. There are highly sophisticated, much more. Uh, um, uh, robust and much more uh, efficient algorithms out there. My point is to demonstrate how you can formulate problems uh, using the mathematical framework, into, uh, using the optimization framework. So I hope I hope uh, uh, that's coming through in the in these slides. All right. Um, so one of the things and the, uh, which I always uh, uh, want to talk about is that it's not just about taking a problem, solving it. Um, and and just getting a result. And it's also a question of analyzing what the problem is, how we can um, extract relevant pieces of information from it. Can we, if if all we are looking for is some obscure piece of information, can we do it in a more efficient way? All these questions. So this is the exploration part of it. You know, uh, of of how you can treat an optimization problem and get uh, um, interesting. Um, uh, properties and relations and st stuff like that outside. So in order to demonstrate that, I'm going to take this example wherein I have a arbitrary region and I want to find the smallest um, sphere that encompasses this region. Uh, and for that, I need to find the center of that sphere and the radius of that sphere. So these are my, that's my region. I have a bunch of points associated with it. And the formulation is basically, I want to minimize find the smallest uh, sphere, so which means I need to minimize my R. And so I need to find the radius and I need to find the center of my sphere. 
such that all these uh, all the points uh, from this region lie inside that sphere. So this is literally my entire formulation. Okay, and we're going to go ahead and solve it, and it comes back pretty, pretty, actually very quickly. You get your radius, you get your center, and you can visualize it. And you can now say, well, good, good for me. The problem uh, is solved. I, no need to move forward. But if you want to start asking questions at this point, uh, one of the most obvious question is, which one of these points from my original region actually touches the surface of my sphere? And well, um, you can do that. Uh, obviously, you can take the center of the sphere, get the radius, plug it back into the constraint, and see which one of them is below a certain tolerance. And uh, and, and you get back a result. But the question is, well, is can we can we obtain this um, hidden information in some other way? Okay. And that's what that's what I want to focus on next, which is that a pro, an optimization problem can be reformulated in a way that uh, it might uh, work to your advantage. So for this very specific problem, I can reformulate it as a maximization problem. Um, wherein each one of the points is given a certain weight. And the ones with the most weight are the ones that will contribute more towards uh, uh, the uh, finding the center and the radius of the sphere. So in this case, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, co convert this as a weighted optimization problem. And instead of a minimization, it's now an, uh, uh, it's a maximization problem. And what you end up getting is a set of weights for each one of the points in the domain, uh, in the region, you have a weight associated with it, but you'll notice that many of the weights are very close to zero. Also, you will notice that it, the amount of time it took for you to solve it is significantly less because technically I've formula, I've converted this generic problem into a, a quadratic optimization problem, but that happens behind the scenes. So if you want to find the uh, radius and the center, you just, uh, that information can be extracted out by just looking at the minimum uh, value associated with it. And that's your answer. And if you want to know only the uh, extreme points that are available with it, then you just look at the weights. The ones that uh, have a non-zero weight, those are the ones that contributed to the, uh, to the uh, construction of the sphere. So that so it's not always about just uh, uh, you know blatantly putting the problem in in its raw form. Sometimes it's a good idea to reformulate the problem um, uh, depending upon your solution. The thing that I want to uh, uh, bring to your attention is that we have something actually quite powerful called the dual maximizer. The dual maximizer actually allows you to extract all this information uh, without having to resolve the problem. And or reformulate the problem. So I'll, I'm going to solve the same problem uh, using conic optimization, but one of the solution properties I'll extract is called the dual maximizer. So when I extract the dual, um, you'll see that most of the uh, results you get out are zero. And if you extract which one of those are non-zero, they actually end up giving you uh, uh, the, the, the points that actually matter. And so if you can now visualize it, the advantage over here is when you saw, so what I'm doing is I'm now solving the problems as a convex optimization problem. And when you do it in this form, underneath the solvers, they solve uh, it using a what is called as a primal dual approach. The algorithms will always have a primal dual approach. And that dual information is solving a complementary uh, problem, uh, but you get, it's, it's like a freebie. You obtain a freebie set of information that you can uh, exploit. And which is exactly actually what we do behind the scenes when we solve certain problems. And I'll show you that. Um, and so I've spoken to great lengths about what a dual is and why should I care about it. Uh, it's because underneath, even though we are not doing, uh, the solver is not doing much, it is actually solving another set of problems in order to, uh, uh, in order to, get, the, uh, to get the final result. And that can... Uh, that contains a lot of useful information. So let me show you a couple of examples of that. Um, let's say that I have, um, this is a geometry problem. Let's say I have two convex polygons and I want to find a line that uh, uh, that bisects these two uh, such that you know the distance between that bisecting line is uh, is the same. Uh, the distance between the, between the line and these two polygons is minimized. And so you can formulate the problem actually as a simple one-liner. You can basically say, 
I have, I want to minimize the distance between point P1 and P2. Um, and uh, that, uh, so this P1 and P2 are elements of P1 is an element of this first convex polygon. P2 is an element of the second po convex polygon. And I want to find the shortest distance between those two, uh, between the points. And it gives us a result. So it says that P, this is the point on um, uh, polygon one, and this is the point on polygon two, and that's what it is. But if from this, you can also extract the, the separating hyperplane that'll, that uh, separates these two convex uh, polygons. And you can do that using the dual. So you can what you can do is you can extract out the constraints and you can extract out the dual and you can then construct a hyperplane using that dual information. And all through this uh, one single formulation, you don't have to change anything. You just, it's a question of how you interpret your dual information. So um, the reason I spent so much time in this is because I wanted to share with you what we do behind the scenes when it comes to mixed integer convex optimization. We actually use this dual information, which I've talked about in order to generate um, what are called as outer approximations of the of the of the constraints of the region and use that in order to uh, solve a uh, mixed integer problem. So uh, instead of going through the theory, let me show it to you graphically through an example. Uh, so here we have a very simple example. You have um, an objective, negative x, negative neg minus x minus y, and you have some constraints. And, but you want the x to be an integer. So you, you can just send it off to convex, optimiz convex optimization or conic optimization. It gives you a result. What's happening behind the scene is we are actually using the dual information in order to uh, obtain this solution. So let me, let me walk you through that step by step. So first thing we do is we'll take the conic optimization, but instead of uh, specifying it as an integer, we just give it as a real. So this is called as a relaxed problem. And we extract the primal and the dual information from it. Now from the dual information, just like I did with the hyperplane problem, I construct the hyperplane for, for the associated with this, uh, with this relaxed problem. And so this is the relaxed problem. And I, the, the, I obtain a hyperplane associated with it. And what I do is now that I know the equation of this hyperplane, I plug that back into my, uh, into my, uh, into a, a linear optimization problem with this hyperplane information. And I solve my, uh, solve a linear problem that says that I want it to be an integer. And I get a value of negative one. I plug that negative one value back into my original relaxed convex problem. I solve it and notice that I have, it now has reached the, um, the, uh, the optimal solution. And if you look at the hyperplane associated with it, you can see this was the first one. There's my second one, and it finds the solution here. So with it, so this outer approximation method using, so what we're doing internally is we're using this dual information recursively in order to solve um, our convex optimization problem. And if I, if I uh, repeat it multiple number of times, I'll get the same result. So it, it reaches convergence and in general, it reaches convergence fairly, fairly quickly. Okay. Moving on, uh, so uh, I've, I've left this uh, slide over here for you because there are lots of tips and tricks that you can use to model integer um, or mixed integer problems that will allow you to um, uh, uh, do all sorts of things. Uh, if you go to uh, um, uh, the Wolfram blog post, I've actually put, a, put together, I've written a blog on how to uh, generate Sudoku solvers and how to generate Sudoku problems. Uh, using this mixed integer uh, approach. And I highly recommend that you uh, look through that. So there's a lot of things that we can do with uh, with um, uh, with optimization by manipulating it and uh, modifying it into a mixed integer problem. Uh, one note of warning is that just because you can doesn't mean you should, because mixed integer is actually a, uh, is a, a quite an expensive thing to do. It's, uh, it's, it's a very hard... Uh, Thing. it's NP hard and it's uh, it sometimes it can it can bog your machine down so um, th that's just a cautionary thing but having said that with this kind of uh, modeling tips and tricks you it, the 
kind of problems that you can solve can be expanded significantly. <clears throat> so here's, here's one example. Wherein um, we could solve the problem using efficient methods, but we're going to solve it using the mixed integer approach. <clears throat> so I have um, an obstacle, um, which, which is def defined using this convex mesh. And if you were to look at that, it looks something like this, right? And um, so this, this convex region can be specified as a set of inequal linear inequalities. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a start point and an end point, which is represented by these black dots. And the object is to find a path from the start point to the end point such that it doesn't cross this obstacle. Okay, so that's our objective. So I'm going to divide my path into 10 different segments, uh, into 10 different segments. And each one of them is uh, of that uh, points, those 10 points uh, are represented by an X and Y coordinate. So that's my, those are my variables, P vars. And then um, I, want, uh, I want to make sure that the distance from the start to the end point is minimized. So that's what I'm trying to do. And so, so that's my objective that I'm trying to minimize. And uh, I know what my start and the end point of the constraints are because th those are known. I give some additional information saying that in, between these two points of my segment, I don't want too much of a distance between them. Otherwise it can just, uh, it might, the solution you get might not be uh, as optimal. So I give us a distance constraint. And then uh, at this point in time, this is where the mixed integer magic happens. I basically say that each one of the points should adhere to this constraint uh, wherein if uh, if a point if a point is inside the convex polygon, then it's obviously shouldn't be there. So in order to make sure that all the points lie outside the polygon, I use mixed integer in or, uh, uh, approach in order to uh, ensure that those points will be outside of my polygon. And so those are called as uh, so I've set up set that up as avoidance constraints. Okay, um, and I set that up and we'll go ahead and solve this. It turns out that this is a quadratic optimization problem. Takes a few seconds to solve it, but um, but you'll eventually get a result uh, for all the uh, positions of uh, of this discretized uh, um, obs uh, the uh, discretized path, and hopefully it'll end. There you go. And this is the start, that's my end. And you'll see that all these, these are the obstacle constraints. I won't go into the math and the detail of why this works, but I'll encourage you to go and look, look, look it up at, a, at your own time and uh, shoot me an email. And here's my result. And obviously the first thing you should notice is that, bam, it is doing, it, it, there, is, there, is an, um, there is a problem here it's actually going uh, through the object uh, when it's not supposed to. And the reason for that, there are two reasons. One is that the number of points I've used is not much. So it's it's still satisfying all the constraints. It's just that it blindly goes through it because it doesn't know any better. So there is there are a couple of approaches to fix a problem like this. One is we can increase the size of this polygon and then solve the problem again. This will allow it to go past it. So in order to do that, the simplest thing to do that for this problem is to take this B. So the, the polygon is represented by AX plus B greater than or equal to zero. So if I were to add a, a small offset to it and then solve the problem again, it'll, it'll recompute and it'll, it should return a new solution that takes into account this expanded polygon. There you go. And now when you see the problem, it has it has shifted. So essentially what I did by adding that offset in my linear inequality constraints is that I made the um, uh, I made the thing much bigger. So if I were to do a region plot of a dot x plus b greater than or equal to zero, Red. Uh, and yeah, I am doing it in the most inefficient way possible, but I'll just show it to you. Uh, 
that's because it's supposed to be x and y. There we go. That's my polygon. And when I add the offset, it makes it bigger. That's what's that's what I'm doing behind the scene. Okay. All right. So uh, finally, I want to just quickly go over something called as robust optimization. Um, in robust optimization, uh, I have a couple of questions. Let me see if I can quickly address that. Um, Um, uh, convex and conic optimizer hyperplane information. He gets rid of the negative one and then finds a solution by approximation. Yes. What does he divide in 10 parts? I divided the path. The path is supposed to be a continuous path, uh, Dom, uh, but um, I, I discretized that path into 10 equal parts. That's what uh, the, the, it's not the whole square or the polygon. It's the path that I took. So let me just go back. You see, I discretized. So you can see that there are a certain number of points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that's what I discretized. Okay. I hope that makes it clear. I'm sorry if I ran through it and it wasn't clear, but I discretized the path that it takes. Okay. So uh, finally, I want to... There's just way too much for me to cover. So, but I'm I'm trying to uh, touch on just some of the more obvious ones and some of the more uh, important ones. So this this one is called uh, optimization with uncertainty. So let's take the simplest example. Let's say that you have a convex optimization problem with certain bound constraints. There's no mystery here. You get a result. But what if the upper limit of this x and y was uncertain to you? It's not one, but it's maybe one plus delta or one minus delta. In that case, what is what kind of an optimization value should it return? Because if you were to just take this and you have an uncertain bound, then for certain values, this result will be invalid. So the question is, what is the best possible solution I can find for an optimization problem when I'm uncertain about certain parameters? Okay. And so that's what I mean over here. Okay, one plus delta and one uh, plus delta y. Well, what if the uncertainty is uh, in, in a range? So in that case, what you could technically do is you can set up a whole slew of constraints taking into uh, account all possible um, um, variations and combinations of delta x and delta, delta y, set up this massive uh, new optimization problem and then solve the problem for the best possible result, in which case it takes all the uncertainty into account and you get a new result. Problem is that you can't do that for all cases. And even if you can, you have made the problem highly, highly inefficient. And it's uh, sometimes it won't even return an uh, optimal solution. So in order for us to uh, do that, we have actually, and the, the math is a lot more complicated, so I won't go into the detail of that, but uh, we have a function called as robust convex optimization that will allow you to take into account any uncertainty that you have if you're not sure about uh, your inputs uh, or, or you know the, and you know what kind of, uh, 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 you know, uncertainty exists with, with, with your data. So in this case, uh, a very typical case scenario is that you have some uh, experimental data, but the measurements that you have received aren't uh, you aren't sure about that. But you, but you know that they lie within an interval of negative one to one. So the question is, what is the best kind of fit I can get so that it takes into account this uncertainty on my output? Okay. So in this case, I'm going. I want to fit a cubic polynomial to this uh, to this my experimental data. So I'm going to set up the problem. I have the basis. I set up uh, what is called as a design matrix, which if you look at it, it's just like it's a matrix of uh, four by n number, whatever is the number of data points. And your objective is to minimize the uh, difference between the input and the output. And you want to find the coefficients of that uh, polynomial. So that's my objective. And I want to minimize the uh, uh, L2 norm associated with it. And in this case, we use a function called robust convex optimization, wherein we have a parameter and that uh, parameter lies uh, uh, is associated with our uncertainty. And when we solve the problem, we get a set of um, coefficients. And you can, you can then check that this is indeed the most robust solution by developing your own models with different uh, parameters like we did in our that simple example before. 
And then, you know, you can develop like 200, 300 different models, whatever number of models, and, and compare that with the ones that we have obtained. So the one we have obtained is, is this black line. And the one, uh, every, all the other models that we have over here, all 200 of them, they lie in this, uh, in this pink region. But we have through, uh, through the reformulation and through uh, figuring out uh, uh, proper analysis, the results that we get is uh, through the, this black line, which is significantly more efficient uh, and, and is uh, much more quote unquote robust. So this is, this is a very specialized field of uh, uh, optimization that uh, we have functionality for. And, and, and there are a lot of applications associated with it. If you're in the field of finance or, uh, um, and are looking into things like, uh, for example, portfolio optimization, and you're trying to measure risk and, uh, um, and, and you know, um, uh, volatility, and, and, and you have these parameters available, uh, using robust convex optimization would be uh, the perfect way to do it. Um, there is one more question from Tom. What does constraint mean? The fact that he cannot cross the object. Oh, so this is back to that. Uh, um, this one. Uh, yes, the constraint basically means that I need to find a path, and I have uh, an object, and that object is my constraint, and it cannot cross that constraint. Yeah, you have it absolutely right. Okay, uh, that actually brings me uh, to the end of my talk. Actually, um, I didn't want to. Uh, I've, I know I've shown you a lot of information. There are lots and lots of functionality. Um, I would highly recommend that you uh, go through our uh, documentation in order to see the uh, various capabilities that we have. I wanted to give you just a very broad overview. Um, uh, hopefully uh, down the road, I could do something more specialized wherein we can talk about uh, if you are one of those guys who wants to develop your own solvers, then uh, we have an entire optimization framework that's available to you that allows you to uh, plug in your own custom built solver uh, to solve all, all, all our problems. As a matter of fact, some of the solvers that we have put together all use that framework and that is also available to you. <clears throat> and there are there is very detailed documentation and tutorial for that. <clears throat> um, and uh, yeah, um, uh, just to give you an idea, uh, the, here's another example of a structural um, uh, engineering problem that you can use simple mathematical optimization problems uh, to design things like bridges. Um, and this is one example, uh, Boyd, uh, who is like a really heavyweight in the field of optimization has um, uh, other problems that, that use the same principles that uh, to solve those problems. Um, so I, I'd recommend, there's, there's a lot of reading material. If you want any information, uh, let me know. Uh, you can always, um, this is my email. If you want to send send me something uh, or have any questions, please free, feel free to reach out to me or through any of our um, other um, uh, other uh, options. So uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and end the talk. Uh, I'll, I'll of course take some uh, whatever questions there are. Um, so there's one question. Um, thank you. And for solvers specialized for circular statistics. Who at Wolfram should I contact to learn what I can use for my problem space? So the question is, um, he, uh, there is a need for solvers specialized for circular statistics. Okay. I don't know what circular statistics are. Um, so I don't know how to answer your questions, but um, if you can uh, just shoot us an email um, and um, uh, maybe I can do a little bit of uh, a research on what circular statistics actually is, uh, I might be able to provide you with that information. Uh, I should mention, um, the best way to reach out to anyone in Wolfram, at least to my opinion, is through tech support. Um, these guys are um, uh, are excellent at, uh, uh, at responding. I myself was tech support at one time, so I'm probably biased, but uh, yeah, uh, our tech support is, um, is uh, really good. And if you have, uh, if you want to reach out, reach out to our tech support group and um, and they if, if they can't answer the question they'll stream it down to uh, one of us so so I uh, I hope I'll be able to answer that in the future um other questions um 
Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions right now. If you if you do think of any other questions or uh, you think that uh, you would like um, uh, to learn more about a sp specific topic um, uh, or need need us to cover some functionality that you don't think exists, um, please let us know. Um, I, I should point out that Nina, who is my colleague, uh, and we both are working full-time on the optimization project, uh, she is uh, uh, constantly adding new functionality and new solvers um, that are very popular to use uh, uh, in the optimization field. So she keeps on adding new stuff. So, um, you know, if, if there's a certain problem that cannot be solved or is taking a lot of time to solve right now um, with, uh, with Nina's brilliant work, uh, you know, uh, we, we should be able to add uh, those, those uh, many of those problems will be able to get solved down the road uh, with, with the addition of new solvers or new methods or uh, new processing capabilities. So shout out to Nina for that. Okay, um, so I'm seeing that there are no other questions. So I'm going to assume that everybody was super, super happy and understood every every single thing that I said. Uh, and uh, we are going to let's go ahead and uh, close the session today. Um, um, thank you once again for all of you guys for coming and uh, listening to the talks. I really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully uh, we can we can do more of these uh, down the road. So with that, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen. Uh, thank you once again.